Uh, first up on the agenda today, we have Michael Vassar, president of the Singularity Institute. And he is going to be speaking to you today um, about why you should believe in the singularity and take the idea of the singularity seriously. But before he does that, he needs to explain to you why you should take any idea seriously. Please take the floor, Mike. And can we get a big round of applause and welcome for Michael Vassar, president of the Singularity Institute. Hi, so it's nine o'clock on a Saturday. My regular crowd seems to have shuffled in. Uh, let's get started. The uh, advance, please, yes, thank you. All right, that's not the place to start. One slide back. Ah, uh, that's not the place to start. One slide back. Uh, thank you, good. This should just go forward and backward. So, the topic of this talk is the Darwinian method why science works, how scholarship helps, and um, how scholarship helps and where we're going. The uh, main reason for giving the talk is that there's an obvious question when you first hear about the singularity. Wow, living forever, all of this amazing technology merging with machines, but is it science or science fiction? Is this a scientific thing to talk about? And I think that if we're going to answer that question, we have to clarify what things we mean by science. And it's not one thing, there are several different things. And really, focus on the question, is it a rational thing to talk about? As well as, it, is it a scientific thing to talk about by different meanings of scientific? Um, I'm unsurprisingly going to say yes, but you don't need to wait for the ending to guess that. Um, so, what is science? The first thing that I would want to say is Roman aqueducts, Gothic cathedrals, sailing ships, before Ben Franklin wrote his essay saying, hey guys, let's use science when building ships. And of course, market prices, which have, are very fashionable these days as sources of information. These are examples, it seems to me, of things that are rational, but not scientific. You don't build a Gothic cathedral just by slapping some stones together. You're doing something right. You're doing something that integrates information. But if we consider building a Gothic cathedral scientific, then we have another question, which is, what happened in the 17th century? Before the 17th century, Europe was basically a backwater with really good art. There were cities all over the world that were just would dwarf any European city and had much higher levels of literacy, etc. But they... Um, suddenly all got left behind starting around the 17th century and really peaking in the 19th century. So until then, civilizations had been rising and falling for two, three, four thousand years, maybe even five. We keep getting to roughly the same level of development before they fall. Metallurgy progresses continually, agriculture continually, but the Indus Valley civilization has run, running water. Naso in 2300, 2500 BC. Naso, ancient Crete, has that, and also primitive printing, large-scale engineering projects. Obviously, the pyramids are a great example of something fairly impressive. No one really gets past that, despite many rises and falls, until basically 300 years ago, 200 years ago, and once they get past it, they go boom, way past it. So this is not something you would get out of a normal distribution. It, it, you need to invoke a new cause. So there's something new, and the words we use to describe that something new are capitalism, which I'll touch on somewhat, and science. But if science is new then, as I say, what built those cathedrals? Well, before science, there were other rational inventions or methods of rationality. The Archimedes, the mathematician, is a great exemplar of these rational methods. He probably didn't really build mirrors to put the uh, sails of ships in flames, and he probably didn't really build cranes to pick ships, ships up from the harbors in order to defend Syracuse, but he surely was building machines used in the defense of the city 
based on mathematical calculations he was doing with his concepts such as leverage and you know his simple machines his he was doing turning physical relationships into equations so that people could work with the equations figure out what physical structures would work and build the structure without having to test it that much beforehand without having to start with an almost identical structure and make random changes he was doing engineering he had the rules of a logical argument and dialogue the famous eureka the eureka moment was when he had worked out logically that the water displacement meant that a heavier object in a boat would displace more than a a less heavy object or a denser object more than a less dense object and since gold was heavier than any, any other element this principle could be used to test the purity of gold it's a great idea great logical argument triumph of ancient greek thought but it's not really science because you're not testing your experiments among other things you're just coming up with a conclusion and running with it it you know that should get thrown out of court because if you allow lots of archimedes is some of them will come up with plausible sounding arguments for anything and you'll execute a lot of in, innocent uh, statue makers so um archimedes seems to have been a bit weak in the whole common sense d- dimension the eureka moment was followed by running around naked screaming about it and his uh, last moments were followed by not stopping when the roman soldier told him to stop doing math so um i think we probably all know people like that if not you'll meet them anyway so um <laughs> why wasn't what archimedes doing science well even before archimedes mythically or vedicius he's also doing something like engineering but it's still not science first of all you're not testing a hypothesis you're not saying i think this will work and either way whether it works or not i'm learning something important because it seems like it has to work based on my knowledge or because i'm genuinely unsure you're just using your now understanding to build something it also didn't have organized literature and publication standards not only was archimedes not looking for refutation there wasn't any standard place where someone could go to refute him uh finally what does this mean well we have something that obviously worked archimedes built these devices so did other people in the ancient world but their method basically only allows progress by geniuses and the, that progress doesn't add up other people don't imitate it and it dies it requires an extremely high level of honesty now there are some ways that people can be trained to be more intellectually honest playing games tends to provide rapid feedback that keeps people honest because you find out you were wrong from the system very rapidly but for the most part people aren't very good about being honest with themselves and throw in politics forget it which really means that uh intellectual progress in the social domains doesn't work with the sort of logical arguments that Archimedes was do- using. Um it also without the literature just can't incorporate that many people. Other elements of ancient rationality you see here Raphael displaying the market of Athens and you have on display people making naturalistic explanations. I mean we th- may think the scientific world view is nice and a big advance over what came before, but even what became a f- came before was a big advance. Alchemy is so much better than everything being done by spirits in terms of what sort of an explanation it is and um the Etruscans by say 700 BC were saying hey i don't think the gods are causing lightning i think maybe it's just clouds banging into each other making a lot of noise and maybe knocking out sparks you know that's wrong but it's so much less wrong than thor and zeus So the nat- naturalistic explanations tell you what sort of answer you should even be thinking about and that really helps if you want to go out in nature and explain things philosophy which is basically the clarification of concepts and definitions socrates is always asking people to define things figure out what this means can we break this concept into two different concepts can these two concepts be distinguished the idea that fast can be broken down into acceleration and velocity as two completely logically distinct concepts the idea that inertial mass and gravitational mass that the perfect correlation between these two concepts might mean they were fundamentally the same and what sort of same thing could they be these are 
fundamentally philosophical advances. And the big problem with them is that they still require the lone geniuses and fail to make long-term incremental progress. Although to be fair, all of the sciences branch off from philosophy. Craftsmanship. That's how you build ships before Franklin. It's how you build aqueducts and cathedrals. It, the ancient Greeks called it techne, and it's not science or engineering either. You know, the uh, cathedrals might have built with, been built with engineering, but long before the cathedrals, people were building huts, and they weren't doing any equations at all. But they were still doing something rational because the huts worked. Exploratory data collection. The large majority of what we call science and have scientists doing in the modern world is this. You run experiments using standard methodologies. You write down what you see. Before you did that, you would look up with the sky, at the sky with, with a telescope or cross the ocean and describe the animals you see. These are all exploratory data collection too. It's by far the largest job in science, but by itself, it doesn't seem like it's enough or we would have had a scientific revolution 10,000 or 100,000 years ago when people started looking around and telling people about things instead of 300 years ago. Markets and hierarchies, between themselves, they can fight it out, d discuss their efficiency, the efficiency of markets versus the ability to direct hier hierarchies. But when it comes to uh, com comparisons with anarchy or everyone just doing stuff at random without considering other people, these two systems of organization are both awfully similar. They're both ways of creating ma rational aggregate human behavior out of the interactions of somewhat rational individual parts which are obeying simple rules. And finally, scholarship, which is the major topic of this uh, essay, frequently confused with science. Scholarship is what everyone did before Galileo and Bacon, and more importantly for this discussion, it's what a lot of people are still doing. Uh, and it's a very important part of what makes science possible while not being the only thing. Well, what is the scholarly scientific method, as I'm going to call it? The method of, as I'll say later, Rousseau above all, but the method of all basically geologists ever. The scholarly scientific method is when you go around, make observations, and then more or less make hypotheses independently of one another. And the fact that multiple people generate the same hypothesis is itself evidence. This is where you get concepts. This is basically all of psychology. It's basically all of economic history and all of history, what we call the humanities, but also a lot of the social sciences and all of the foundational assumptions behind the social sciences are essentially coming from philosophy generated with the scholarly method. So what's this method? You find people who learn well. You teach them to notice their ignorance and to want to cure it. The older you get, the more you see what you expect to see, as we have a magician to explain sooner or later. The older you get, the more you see what you expect to, and the less you're going to be open to even perceiving new things. But if you keep aware of your ignorance, keep consciously aware of the probability that you're going to be fooled, you can at least doubt your eyes and look for another explanation. Uh, have people read broadly, guided by curiosity and seeking surprises. It's nice to memorize passages from Confucius, but if you really want someone who's going to have new ideas, you probably want them to choose their own books to some degree and also to have a shared canon and to discuss these ideas in an institutional setting where they can find other people who are reading the same things and thinking about them but not all too close so that the different groups can have their own culture, come to their own conclusions and fight it out. You have people seek and write about diverse life experiences. Travel is the traditional thing to do. Having different careers, doing any sort of variety of different work. Chaucer is a great example of this, being a diplomat and spy and author and scientist. And, but many of the early scientists were brilliant scholars, made Renaissance men. And this maintained that openness to new perceptions that sabbatical is supposed to maintain, although it continually gets eroded away, etc. cetera. And, fi and finally, because of the independent discovery being evidence, you look for convergence. This can work. All of the geologists 120 or 130 years ago said the Earth was more than 100 million years old because they could see the geological processes that made geological features, and they said, this looks like 
the sort of thing, the Grand Canyon looks like the sort of thing that water would wear in the desert, but it would take, oh my, very long. So um, they concluded the Earth was old, and they concluded it independently of one another, and therefore each of their conclusions added evidence to that, and fundamentally they turned out to be right, and the physicists turned out to be wrong. So yep, scholarship can even beat physics at least once. Um, what, why does scholarship work? Human children are learning machines. They're not actually scientists in the crib, but they are certainly rational, rationalists in the crib. They're systems for turning a territory, turning a mess of data inputs into a map, a story about the world, a system for prediction and guiding action. They um, see the same thing over and over. They love to see the same cartoon over and over. But songs and repetitious data of any sort helped them to make sense of their environment. And then independently, they can imitate one another. And the other children from their culture have very similar data anyway. So this provides yet further repetition with some variation. The sort of training set that you would build, want to build a artificial intelligence if all you had to work with was pattern recognition because your processors could only fire a few times a second, basically. That's really a pretty crippling limitation. And it's pretty amazing that uh, evolution could come up with a three pound system to solve that uh, bottleneck. I would never have anticipated that. By comparison, the, the singularity seems so obvious. <laughs> but we'll get to that later. I mean, if I didn't know brains could work, I would never have guessed they could. So you average together the child's experiences with a constrained data set. You average together their behavior with the behavior of their peers by them having an instinct to imitate. You have parents explicitly correcting, providing a updating feedback, a learning set like conditioning. And um, this allows children to learn that a podium is a podium and that clothing are clothing. It allows them to learn that if you touch fire, you get burnt. And if you scale this method up, it allows you to learn that mountains are just su such and such an age. If you scale this method up, it allows you to discover that mammals and reptiles and birds seem to have common origin as fish, as I'll get to later. Um, it's actually basically pattern recognition and intuition with brains that actually work as fairly good universal pattern detectors. Now, if you want scholarship to work, you want to amplify childhood curiosity. So you make sure that people continue to encounter more and more varied data sets as they get older. As your model gets better, you have less motivation to build a model and more motivation to just use it without trying to consult it, which is faster. This is, once again, how I would build an AI. The optimal amount of resources to invest in learning is finite. It's some fraction of your total resources. We may not have solved the decision theoretical questions of how much thought you should give to thinking about thinking about thinking, but there's clearly a correct enough answer that evolution could figure stuff out in a non-infinite amount of time. So if you are a society you, the amount that you want to invest in learning is greater than the amount that you want to invest in learning if you're a child, because a society has more resources than a child. So you want to concentrate incentive in a few super children, we'll call them scholars, who seem to be very good at what children do, who seem to be unusually neotenous, unusually childlike as they're growing up, who listen to orders well and pay attention and imitate adults well, who um, like to learn new things and to repeat themselves, and who follow logical arguments, long chains of reasoning intuitively and reach surprising conclusions. You take these scholars and you give them incentives. You keep them in a varied environment and you give them incentives to keep learning, to not specialize too much. This is hard because you're doing something profoundly unnatural. If it was adaptive, to learn throughout your life, to be a lifelong learner, then evolution would have made it automatic. The fact that people default to not doing it, get into a rut, and know less than twice as much when they're 60 as they did when they were 30, tells us that we don't have an innate drive to continue to uh, explore and build a better model. And we need to maintain cultural institutions that actively generate that exploration if we're going to maintain uh, 
new insights into our age. So um, how do you create them? You arrange for the, these diverse experiences. The larger your population, the more scholars you can have, and the worse errors you can tolerate in them. Because the, as long as you can keep their conclusions independent of one another, you can tolerate very big errors from individuals as long as you're averaging things together. However, scholarship has its weaknesses. You know, for thousands of years, scholars claimed that the world was created by a big man who had lightning bolts that he threw at people he didn't like. Um, why does this happen? It happens because of correlated errors. We all have the same basic brain architecture. Some elements of our life experience are the same for all of us. And this causes everyone to reach the same wrong conclusions for a lot of questions, or at least enough people to do so, to keep a scholarly community wrong forever about questions like, is lightning caused by big men? Now, in order to uncorrelate errors within a community, preventing information cascades, which are when I think something, so you think it because I think it, and then he thinks it because we both think it. In order to avoid correlations within a community, you need separate universities, separate scholarly communities. And ideally, they should all be continually coming into contact with one another to have their ideas challenged. The internet might not be the best thing for this. By bringing all the scholarly communities together at once, it might be the equivalent of trying to generate more power by breaking down the rotors in your power plant so that the steam can all escape at once because that's a higher, more rapid release of energy. Anyway, you need separate communities to average out their errors, but ideally you would want separate species to average out species errors, separate body types to average out body type errors, separate uh, serial versus parallel processing trade-offs, etc. There's a lot of types of error that you would like to uh, not have to all draw from humans, and since all of our scholars are humans, that limits scholarship. Scholarship also has a bias towards surprising claims. If a great thinker realizes that the sky is blue, he can tell people and no one cares. If a bad thinker tell, realizes it, they can also tell people and no one cares. All right, so with a bias towards surprising claims is in, in the scientific world called publication bias. Richard Feynman drew a lot of attention to it in his books and tried to fight against it. But the fundamental uh, incentives really make it hard to fight against publication bias. It's just very hard to convince people that you're doing great work when you tell people that science proves that parents love their children, or when you say that science proves that most plants are green. Even if you have some great statistical methodology, and even if we in fact should be a hundred times more confident of these claims after you've said them than before, people are just so overconfident anyway that Instead of thinking it's 99.999% certain, or throw in another three nines, that plants are green, they think that they're completely certain. Of course, we know from quantum mechanics that that's not true. You really just shouldn't be that certain about the world you live in. Other problems with scholarship, it develops its own vocabulary, becomes unable to talk to outsiders, and tends to become ever more specialized so people can read the same things, and their correlated conclusions can mean something. What changed in the 17th century? We went from that to that. It's uh, something changed. Well, I think it was radical skepticism. People, there had been skeptical philosophers going back to ancient Greece. But skepticism in ancient Greece meant you should try to consider both sides of an argument in order to see how unreliable your thinking is. Skepticism in the Middle Ages meant something different. It meant an attempt to literally doubt everything. Well, what would motivate such a crazy idea as trying to doubt everything? Theology, actually. We had these religions that said that being wrong might matter more than it sounded like it would. For instance, if you were wrong about whether the, the Holy Spirit was of the same substance or not as the, God the Father, this might mean that you would be set on fire forever instead of given a nice, uh, nice retirement. So... Um, this sort of motivation led some people to try desperate measures to avoid being wrong about things that it seemed like they couldn't possibly know. For instance, they tried to doubt everything and see whether they could figure everything out from things that they found out that they couldn't doubt. Descartes famously said that his own existence was the only thing you could start out being certain of, and from that you can prove all of your ordinary experiences. Since we know that you can't prove all of our ex ordinary experiences, once again, magicians, we know that Descartes was wrong, so what we have to ask is, 
What can you prove from your experiences? However, I think that people think of Descartes as being the only guy who did this. Well, I think a lot of people did this. Because other people might have said, you can't doubt that matter has mass and takes up space. Or that you can't doubt that solids are full, that there's no space inside of solids. People might have doubted, said that you can't doubt that heavier objects fall faster than lighter objects. And other people might have said that you can't doubt that two objects, if you tie them together, are, do not become one object. And other people might have said you can't doubt that two objects can't fall faster by tying them together, which seemed to mean that logic itself couldn't be certain or couldn't be trusted. Short logical chains from things you couldn't doubt might disagree. So if you could do that with short logical chains, maybe you could do that with long logical chains and find out what god to worship and not be tortured. That would be fun. Anyway, this search for absolute certainty led to having long chains of reasoning from foundations that seemed solid. I'm going to call this enlightenment science. And Galileo is the exemplar of it, the Leaning Tower of Pisa. He shows that the principle that tying objects together doesn't make them fall faster. His intuition there is stronger than his intuition that heavier objects fall faster. And um, the chain of inference that led him to see that conflict then leads him to make an experiment to test. This is a win-win. He's finding out one more thing he can disbelieve. You look for surprising conclusions from the logic. You test the conclusions. And the key thing about enlightenment science is that you don't need to be a genius to do it. You can all do enlightenment science and control your tendency to fool yourself well enough that progress can add to other progress. And you don't need to personally trust that the person who's telling you something is super honest. They can not only tell you their conclusions, they can tell you how they got those conclusions, and you can do the test yourself. Okay. So, enlightenment science, unfortunately, has its own downsides. Everything tends to. One is that seemingly, you can see the double slit behind me, seemingly necessary ontological assumptions can be false, but the real assumptions can be basically unthinkable, too difficult to conceive of, so that you're not going to get there with, in a clear way with a strong consensus, and you may not have good argument for testing. Some people's intuitions in favor of Copenhagen collapse over many worlds are very strong. Some people's intuitions in favor of many worlds over Copenhagen collapse are very strong. There isn't any experiment we can do to dis distinguish between those except for people to argue about whose intuitions are better. Um, the other thing about enlightenment science is that you can use its form to justify things that you want to believe. This is a really important point that I'd love to talk about maybe next year. But I'll talk about it briefly this year, giving uh, people like John Locke as exemplars, or Pascal, Pascal's wager. For instance, you can assume some ethical principle that seems like it's hard to doubt, not because it's hard to actually doubt it, but because it would be easy to criticize someone for saying, you don't think killing is always wrong? So you can assume some simplistic ethical principle, like killing is always wrong, and then make some logical chain from that to whatever conclusion you wanted. Or you can uh, assume some epistemic principle, like man is a rational animal, because if man wasn't a rational animal, my reasoning wouldn't matter anyway rather than acknowledging that people can be rational some of the time and irrational at other times, and in fact that there's a structure so that we are on net somewhat more than not at all rational, but we can quantify and describe that irrationality. And uh, when we make our predictions about, say, the economy, don't have to assume that everyone is perfectly informed and perfectly informed about everyone else being perfectly informed, etc. cetera. Um, anyway, in these ways, you can use uh, enlightenment science to f force, basically false conclusions. And eventually those conclusions can lead to a blatant disagreement between what you claim, your beliefs, and everyday reality. You know, for instance, I'm going to move on to this for a second for, okay. Rather than using the scholarly method, okay. Basically, rather than using the scholarly method, I guess the slides will be later, um, to generate hypotheses, and then independently generating similar hypotheses. Okay, so rather in the same hypotheses through the scholarly method, 
it can be very useful to use the scholarly method to generate a hypothesis and then independently generate the same hypothesis through the Enlightenment scientific method. I'm going to say that this is a recipe for important science and also a re recipe for controversy. The uh, shallow success of this to some degree is philosophical liberalism, which had some phenomenal successes at first and then some phenomenal losses. And the uh, deeper successes come from things like the theory of evolution with Darwin and Wallace. The uh, remainder of this is mostly going to be about the uh, scholarly science and how it, scholarly science can work with enlightenment science. I'm, this thing is not advancing. Uh, can someone move forward a few? Okay, not good. All right, I'm just going to have to ad-lib for a while. So, um, scholarly, okay. Darwin had this idea that there was a common origin of species, and this idea was not new to him. It was, a, it was a commonly shared belief of people who'd looked at life, where, because it really looked like there was a fishy common ancestor, say, of reptiles and amphibians and fish. It really looked like there was a continuous distribution of traits from one animal to another, and even from animals to plants. So Darwin had this scholarly hypothesis. And that's what led him to, the, to notice that hypothesis as the outcome of a long logical chain. He said, okay, it looks like all life has a common origin. Can I see why that always had to be the case? See how things I already know tell me that all life has a common origin. And he came up with the theory of natural selection. Now, if we had unlimited logical abilities, the theory of natural selection would have just been come up with three or 4,000 years earlier. I mean, natural selection is just animal breeding is done by nature. It's very simple logic. It come, you know, comes from the idea that you can't grow exponentially forever. That's Malth Malthus. And then the idea that organisms inherit traits of their uh, parents, their ancestors. And these two ideas by themselves are enough logically that you could build the theory of natural selection, but that didn't happen. It didn't happen because uh, finding something you want to prove is hard, and scholarship can guide you to your first guess. But then testing, testing the logic with, of enlightenment science can help you to see whether that guess is correct. see whether that guess is correct and uh, move on, even when it disagrees with other guesses. This is an example of the Enlightenment saying things have to get better, but scholars just know that that's not entirely true. It's largely true, it's just not entirely true. And I talked about Ben Franklin and Jean-Jacques Rousseau both reaching the conclusion that savages were better off than Europeans, etc. We'll deal with that later. Um, the Darwinian method, as I say, is using scholarly hypotheses. Now, uh, Darwin is perfect because we have the same scholarly hypothesis being used to generate the same logical argument separately, twice, in rapid succession. Darwin and Wallace, both reaching the same conclusion by the, the same method, gave, gave us the, a perfect scholarly argument, basically, plus a perfect example of the scholarly scientific method done right. Everyone developed their ideas independently, everyone did the same art logic, they didn't, however, make surprising new predictions. They, they made a lot of predictions that were not that surprising, and they made a lot of predictions that were true, but they didn't have some single test case, which made them not a good example of Popperian science. In fact, I think Popper had skepticism about evolution because he had this very narrow definition of science. So this is a good example of why Enlightenment science by itself is so popular. In Enlightenment science, you have some dramatic experiment that allows people to see that you're right, even if they can't follow your logical argument. And without that experiment, you never really can create that same sort of consensus just through the Bayesian updating of people generate a logical argument is evidence, scholar scholarship is also evidence. There's one other big problem with Enlightenment science. Yep, it's that. When you only get to try once, it doesn't help to test your hypotheses. You really need some better way of doing things. So uh, in cases like, definitely do not press this button, I wonder what it does, 
it's really bad to use the scientific method to say, to try to falsify that. Instead, you can use logic and say, maybe if someone put this sign here, they don't want me to press this button, and maybe they don't want me to do so for a good reason. That's a very short, very uncertain logical argument, but it still seems like a good idea to follow that uncertain logical argument. Another modern example of that sort of logical argument is environmentalism. Environmentalism is basically the scholarly hypothesis that humans are doing a lot, and doing a lot is likely to have unintended consequences. So we should be looking for ways in which there are big unintended consequences that might harm our civilization, harm our health, damage our values. And once you start looking, you can uh, see the global climate as one of the sorts of things that might cause trouble. Uh, that people's actions might cause unexpectedly large amounts of trouble by interfering with. So once you notice that, you say, well, maybe the climate will get colder and maybe the climate will get warmer, and you come up with logical arguments for global cooling and for global warming, both of which seem somewhat compelling. And then you search for data to confirm, and you confirm global warming. And then someone else says, no fair, you confirmed one of your two hypotheses, um, but you were not testing against a null hypothesis. And the trouble is, with natural experiments, you can't necessarily. You, um, this is similar, once again, to evolution. You don't have specific predictions. You have some general prediction. We should be looking for common ancestors, but not we should be looking for common ancestors that look just like this. We should be looking for big climate changes, but not we should be looking for climate changes that look just like this. As far as I can tell, the best models we have say the Earth is getting hotter much faster than the even high-end estimates predict, and certainly that glaciers are melting much faster, and that doesn't count as a good confirmation by the rules of enlightenment science. But I'm going to say you can use your own judgment as to whether it, it counts as a good confirmation by the rules of I wonder what this button does. The other thing that uh, environmentalism has produced is a lot of great data collection, that whole exploratory data collection thing, which I said is what most science is anyway. I love just knowing about carbon concentrations in the atmosphere going back 12,000 years from the, or 300,000 years from the uh, Greenland camp. It's just cool. That's why we want science anyway, right? We want the ultimate in just cool. So the singularity is the independently invented similar hypotheses generated by John von Neumann and by Werner Vinge sometime in the 1960s and sometime in, and in 1991 that there was effectively a veil to understanding the future. This veil to understanding the future had to do with the fact that history was created by human intelligence and progress had been created by human intelligence and intelligence had changed everything completely relative to what came before. So when we had new types of intelligence soon, whether they were individual human intelligences or new types of collective intelligences, things like corporations, but actually smart, things like governments, but actually smart, um, which might be possible, clodged together, glued together by computers and good information processing systems and good protocols and management techniques. It seemed that sometime between 2005 and 2030, as von Neumann said, affairs such as we know them cannot continue. And as Vinge said, there's an analogy to the singularity, or rather to the event horizon of a black hole, which you can't see past. Your model breaks down. The system you use to build models of the singularity of a black hole doesn't give a result. The system we use to build models of the future after superhuman intelligence may not give a good, uh, a reliable result. Just like Newtonian physics doesn't work well near the speed of light and gets confused past the speed of light. So independent hypothesis generation by two brilliant guys. Von Neumann was considered, you know, arguably the smartest person ever by lots of people who knew him, Einstein, Godel, you know. And Vinge, who's not von Neumann, but a really smart guy who a lot of people think writes good science fiction and good uh, math too, and computer science. Then you have a logical argument. Vinge again and I.J. Good. Their argument is the intelligence explosion. Once you have systems that are better than humans at building minds, they'll probably be better than humans. I'm um, better than humans at thinking. They'll probably be better than humans at building systems that are better than humans at thinking, at which point intelligence feeds upon itself, 
once again, this is independently invented by a num number of people, the scholarly argument, then the logical argument. And finally, we have the data, the massive exploratory data analysis. Ray Kurzweil builds huge numbers of graphs showing different exponential or near exponential or super exponential growth rates. This practice goes all the way back to the Wright brothers. So Bella Nagy has documented its history and documented it uh, extremely well all sorts of different exponential growth curves across technologies at the Santa Fe Institute. And um, so there, a lot of people have independently, once again, thought that it was worth looking for exponential growth curves in technologies, found them, Perfect scholarly hypothesis, reinforced by three different lines of argument. Therefore, my verdict, rational, also scientific. Any questions? Thank you, Michael. We have time for one question. Does uh, someone want to be the lucky guy? No pressure. All right, um, so when you're talking about, you have multiple hypotheses coming from independent sources. Just to go very skeptical on this, if you're looking at geology, you, that was one of your examples, that multiple sources came together and concluded geological theory. How much independence is necessary? Because if you have people reading other people's work, can you really call it true independent work coming together to create one unified theory? Well. In the ideal form, I think one wants something like fractal independence, self-similar on multiple scale mixing of ideas so that people are constantly challenged by competing hypotheses, but constantly arguing things out and coming together in agreement. That gives you more checks. However, in practice, it looks like a fair amount of independence is necessary, but not an unlimited amount. Certainly, information cascades make systems like markets dangerous as your only method of aggregating data. Part of that is because of a lack of independence, because People are making their uh, conclusions from their beliefs about the other participants. But some of that is inevitable if people are going to be reasonable and be informed by other people's opinions. Thank I hope you. that was an answer. <laughs>